would like to uh, thank uh, Weblio for the invitation uh, to give this talk. Uh, uh, so today I'll be talking about bioresolvable metals, our experience and work that we have done uh, in two areas of uh, hard and soft tissue engineering. So <clears throat> I'll begin with the degradable device market, you know, targeting uh, orthopedic application. And uh, as you can see, bone fractures are extremely common worldwide with several million people affected by this uh, every day and uh, it affects the craniofacial uh, uh, area, the dental implant market, and the orthopedic market. So there's significant need uh, for uh, repair for people who suffer from uh, these ailments. Uh, so how do we fix it? And the mineralized tissue engineering is indeed one way of doing this, and it has become extremely popular uh, since the mid-90s when it was introduced. So the concept of tissue engineering typically is if you have a defect, as shown here, <clears throat> the way to fix it would be is to combine it with the appropriate cells, whether it is osteoplast, chondrocytes, adipose cells, stem cells, and combining it with signaling molecules, uh, either it can be in terms of growth factors or DNA or extracellular matrices, combine it with a scaffold that is resolvable, typically made from uh, polymers and uh, ceramic, and now we have a degradable metals as well, and then you combine it with antigenic factors which can then help regenerate uh, the uh, original defect problem. So <clears throat> for orthopedic scaffolds, there are, uh, if you have small defects, then the body regenerates itself. If you have a critical size bone defect, which is much larger than what the body can heal, then there is a problem. And typically uh, we, use, uh, we use a synthetic material or natural material that can tend to uh, contribute osteoconductivity and osteoinductivity in the form of growth factors. And then you combine it with cells and into the synthetic scaffold. And that synthetic scaffold, as I mentioned, could be a metal, ceramic, and polymer. And, and typically for tissue engineering, we need the material to resolve. So you would normally want to have a resolvable uh, polymer, which is by far being the most popular system like PLA and PLGA. And then you also have hydroxyapatite as a ceramic as well. So typical bone fixation devices that are used for addressing the problem that I just mentioned uh, in terms of the global market, you have the plate and screw, <clears throat> or you have K wires, as well as you have circlage wires that are used as fixation devices that are wrapped around uh, the defect. Or you have, for example, the slip capital femoral epiphysis problem, where you have the bone slippage, uh, bone plate slippage, in which case you need the screw to connect the bone plate to prevent the crosses of the tissue, and then of course, dental implants. So all of these are typically where bone fixation devices are used. And the synthetic bone grafts that are typically used today, as I mentioned, are either you have for addressing the, the bone, which can be either cortical bone or cancellous bone. You have a polymer, um, natural or synthetic polymer that you use, or a ceramic material, which can be in the form of a bioglass or a crystalline hydroxyapatite ceramic. And then you have metals, and the most common metals are typically the non-degradable metals in the form of titanium and stainless steel. So currently used systems for load bearing are typically non-degradable metals that are used. And for non-load bearing scaffolds that are typically the degradable ones because they don't have the strength, typically polymers which tend to be much softer and ceramics that tend to be extremely hard but do not have the toughness that is needed as opposed to metals that seem to be extremely, <coughs> have extremely stiff, uh, you know, but do not have the ability to resolve. So <clears throat> what would be good is if you have a resolvable metal. So let's say if you have a fracture of a distal phalanx as shown here, a typical way to fix this is by using K wires as shown here, uh, where you have a pin or a rod that is placed inside to connect the fragmented bone tissue. Typically suffers from problems like bone pin tract infection as shown here in this image. So what you would like to have is a K wire that would resolve while the fracture heals, eliminating the need for any kind of follow-up device. And then following the principles of tissue engineering, essentially you have an implantable material that is placed in which undergoes degradation. And then eventually the tissue regenerates. So there's a crossover point here. Finally, when the, when the implant has degraded, the tissue has formed, which results in the functional characteristics that is needed. So looking at the currently the synthetic bone grafts and bone fixation device system that I talked about, <clears throat> magnesium has emerged as a popular metal since 2008. And we had the good fortune of being part of a, a National Science Foundation funded engineering research center that focused on 
working extensively on using magnesium uh, as a new metal that can work as a resolvable material that can fix bone implants. And why is magnesium good? If you look at the properties of magnesium, both from the density, from the modulus, compressive yield strength, and fracture toughness, it has characteristics extremely well matched with that of natural bone. That's why it makes magnesium <clears throat> a characteristic material used for bone fixation devices. It is highly biocompatible. It positively stimulates new bone, and it has mechanical properties very similar to natural bone. And as shown here, if you look at the calcium phosphate ceramic or bone void filler characteristics that are typically used today, and then if you look at magnesium, you see that magnesium is far better and, and provides a much better match to natural bone. So magnesium is a good biodegradable uh, metal. It's an essential nutrient. It's the, the amount present in the human body is about 25 grams. The blood serum level is around 0.73 to 1. <clears throat> millimoles. So it's an activator of many enzymes and it can co-regulate protein synthesis and muscle contraction as well and tends to stabilize DNA and RNA. But unfortunately, it's a reactive metal, as we know, and it undergoes hydrolysis rapidly when brought in contact with water, generating hydrogen. And that hydrogen, you know, if it goes beyond the solubility of blood, could be a problem resulting in and gas pockets in the system and, uh, and also leading to necrosis. So controlling the biocorrosion of magnesium is the major challenge. <clears throat> so if you look at magnesium, therefore, you know, because it's a lightest element engineered metal having a density of 1.74 grams and perfectly matched with natural bone, but the corrosion of magnesium is a problem. But nevertheless, it provides a new paradigm shift in biomaterials because it, it provides the ability for having a metal that is well matched with natural bone and can resolve in the body. So it can form a hydroxide as shown by the previous reaction, but then the hydroxide gets easily attacked by the chlorides present in the, in the body to form magnesium chloride, which is a soluble salt, which can then be excreted out into the, uh, into the urine and the feces. And therefore it can be eliminated by the body and does not accumulate in the, in the body. So it makes it a very attractive material. So what we have done is in our lab, we have looked at alloy design to control the corrosion. And we have basically used entity functional theory approach for doing this. Uh, so it's a computational approach that we have used for designing and identifying alloy elements that are biocompatible and that can help control the corrosion or rather slow down the corrosion uh, of magnesium uh, while at the same time being biocompatible. And some of the alloying elements that we have identified are yttrium, calcium, zinc, strontium, zirconium, aluminum, silver, iron, uh, et cetera. And these are used to affect the corrosion properties, but it can also result in favorable corrosion rates. So using our DFT approach, we have basically identified all of these uh, alloying elements and which result in change in microstructure and phase composition to form a dense surface corrosion protection layer. Uh, and some of them give much better protection as opposed to the other. So this is kind of a a chart here that basically shows the performance of these alloying elements in the presence of <clears throat> the biological fluid. Uh, so showing that how some can be slow down the corrosion and some can accelerate the corrosion. So we focused on designing a novel high strength magnesium alloy, which is a combination of yttrium, calcium, zirconium, and zinc. Uh, and uh, we basically use around zero to 4% yttrium, 0.6% calcium, 0.4% percent zirconium and about 2% percent zinc. Uh, and by combining these by adding yttrium and zinc in a ratio of two to one, uh, we essentially end up creating long periodic stacking order, which provides high strength characteristics uh, and can also uh, prevent uh, corrosion. Uh, we already have a patent on this uh, uh, alloy. And uh, we engineered this alloy, we fabricated this alloy, we cast it, and then we extruded this alloy, and then looked at the in vitro direct cytotoxicity uh, using MC3T3 cell attachment on directly in the as cast uh, and the tempered uh, T4 treated alloys at one day. And you can see this is the as cast alloy, this is the uh, T4 treated, uh, uh, thermally treated or annealed sample, and you can see so this is with the one one, that means the yttrium and calcium in the ratio one to one, this is the yttrium and calcium in the ratio of four to one. And you can see that in all of them, <clears throat> there is good cell attachment and viability seen in day one, compared to pure magnesium and aluminum zinc 31 used as a control and tissue plastic as a positive control. <clears throat> when you look at three days, 
you know, there is a slight decrease, a uh, little bit of more apoptotic cells that you tend to see uh, uh, in terms of, because these are all done under stationary conditions. So there is no regeneration or no dynamic fluid flow that happens inside the body. Nevertheless, it shows that there is good cell attachment even after day three. So when we do the indirect cytotoxicity uh, using the MTT assay, uh, both at day one and day three, you can see that uh, there is higher viability at lower extract concentration and lower viability after three days of culture, similar to what was seen in the uh, live dead uh, in vitro study that we showed with uh, MC3D3. So it sort of validates the uh, favorability of the uh, magnesium alloy that we made. So next we wanted to see how it would perform inside the uh, animal. So we uh, did a rat a femoral osteotomy model uh, as shown here. So basically we looked at it in the form of uh, two, di two different devices. One was uh, a rod that we used to put inside the femoral fracture site. And the second one uh, was the uh, circlage uh, wire. So this one is a 15 millimeter length rod, 1.6 millimeters in diameter. And this is how it was basically surgically implanted into the femoral region of the animal. And the second one was the circle large wire, which is 20 millimeters in length and 0.68 millimeters in diameter. So it wraps around the uh, bone defect site. So we basically created a fracture and then implanted this rod into the two ends of the fracture to secure it. And then we wrapped the circle large wire around it. <clears throat> so basically then we looked at time points of two, eight and 14 beats, and we looked at two alloys. This is our yttrium zinc uh, calcium alloy and the titanium-6 aluminum vanadium was used as a control. And this is the image of the ASCAST uh, alloy that we made. So one week after X-ray revealed placement of the implants, you can see the placement of the implant. This is the titanium-6 aluminum-4 vanadium, which shows very clearly a radio-opaque material, whereas <coughs> magnesium tends to be radio-loosened uh, because the density being very light, but never similar to bone. But nevertheless, you can still see it being present. So the one week X-ray revealed about 75% uh, of the animal, there was a gas pocket that was formed because of the initial corrosion that tends to happen. Uh, these, are, these alloys were not refined or not micro, microstructurally controlled or optimized. Uh, basically the composition was made and then we cast them and then looked at it primarily from compatibility and toxicity. So there were initial gas pockets that formed in the first, first week uh, of placement of the implants. <clears throat> and after eight and 14 weeks, you see that there is more rapid initial degradation. And this initial degradation we feel is happening because these animals were not immobilized. So there was no kind of any kind of a, a plate being placed or any kind of a fixation. So they were, no, they were not, so there was not strapping or anything placed on the on the animal. So they were allowed to ambulate after, as soon as we placed the implant in. But nevertheless, it clearly showed that there is degradation over time. And there is also bone formation. So the pins degraded more rapidly near the fracture site, leading to pin failure due to stress corrosion cracking. Uh, and the cracks, of course, propagate corrosion and stress. So if you look at the corrosion rate here, it is initially rapid and then it slows down after eight weeks and, and 14 weeks due to the passivation that tends to happen. <clears throat> and another characteristic is that the new bone overgrowth that you see over the implant, which is typically what happens when you place uh, magnesium. So this is for the circular wire that you normally see. <clears throat> So when we looked at the liver and the and the kidney uh, histology, we see absolutely no signs of any kind of morphological changes. So they are very similar to the non-operated control healthy uh, rat animals, showing that the alloys, even though they were corroding very rapidly in the beginning, but they were accepted by the body very well. And if you look at the magnesium concentration, calcium concentration, and zinc concentration, we found that they were there was no, no significant increase uh, observed in the liver and kidney between the alloy made and the unoperated groups. And the yttrium and zinc were all much less than 0.7 micrograms per gram, or even in the case of zirconium, less than 2.2. So therefore you see that there was not much accumulation of any of the alloying elements in the body. And if you look at newborn formation, we see gradual newborn formation after eight weeks, 
uh, and 12 weeks. So you clearly see this is the golden trichrome strain that was done and you can using the golden trichrome strain, we can clearly see at the eight weeks and 14 weeks, there is new bone formation or stride formation, clearly indicating that there is favorable bone formation from these alloys, even though there is gas pocket that you see uh, in, the, in the beginning. But after 14 weeks, the fracture was not yet completely healed when fixed with either of these. And this was probably because as we said, that the animals were left to ambulate, uh, ambulate freely without any kind of uh, uh, fixation, uh, uh, you know, uh, any kind of a wraparound that was used to, uh, uh, to, to prevent the uh, dislodgement of the implant. Nevertheless, continued osteoclast activity was seen, uh, validated again by the alkaline phosphatase uh, staining. In the case of the uh, circulage wire, it completely degraded, but it was surrounded by new bone, as shown again by the uh, golden uh, trichrome stain. So you can see the mineralized bone matrix. Uh, so this is the new bone uh, that was formed, uh, clearly showing the presence of new bone that is formed. Whereas in the case of titanium, vanadium, aluminum, there is no new bone formation because there's no degradation that is seen. So the the alloy wire cuff completely degraded, surrounded by a new bone that was seen. Uh, so what is the mechanism for mineralization? We feel that there is continued dissolution of magnesium ions that are formed during the initial corrosion that tends to recruit the mesenchymal stem cells along with calcium and phosphate and peptides, uh, either in the form of sibling proteins or non-collagenous proteins that can come in and together they aid in the formation of you know, bone tissue. The next example I will take is on ultra high ductility alloys for tracheal stent application. So when you look at uh, trachea, the major problem with trachea can be either obstruction or weakening of the trachea. And the trachea is typically made up of cartilage <clears throat> that surrounds the outside or cricoid cartilage. And then you have the soft tissue lining the lumen. And, uh, and, and this is how you can typically see the bone tissue surrounding the cartilage, the fibroelastic membrane uh, that is present all along the inside of the lumen of the trachea. And, and that's where you have the mucosa, the submucosa, and then you have the cartilage lining. So typically the problem that can happen are weakening of the cartilage lining, which results in collapse of the, uh, of the trachea. And the treatments are typically, you need to open it by resection and anastomosis or tracheoplasty or interventional pulmonary uh, surgery that is done. Another problem is the obstruction, you know, and that happens in the case of stenosis where there is a problem for inspiration and expiration of the tracheal wall. And you can have either obstruction by creating, uh, either it can be a congenital problem or it can be due to cancer, there is a malignant growth. Either way, there is obstruction of the trachea and the person cannot breathe. So what is the current treatment? So either resection and reconstruction or bronchoscopic tracheal dilation or laser bronchoscopy where you have a laser inside that can obliterate the blocked region or you use airway stenting. And for airway stenting, typically you have silicone stents or metallic stents, nitinol, stainless steel, and all of them, although they have advantages, but the major disadvantage is that they don't degrade, so they tend to remain inside. So biodegradable tracheal stent would potentially solve these issues. And uh, in the market, there are typically polydioxanone, which is used as a biodegradable stent. Uh, but what's the problem with this is that this insufficient mechanical properties, being a polymer, it is very soft. And then it also tends to lead to debris that can cause stenosis. And then three months after implantation, you can see that there is fracture and migration. So it's inadequate. So there's still need to explore better, strong biodegradable uh, tracheal stents. And magnesium alloy affords a new generation of metallic biomaterials that can be used as a stent, even though it undergoes corrosion. But as long as it is a favorable corrosion, it can be controlled so that it cannot does not come into the airway pocket, but it can be dissolve into the blood lining or the tissue lining, then it can certainly be used as a tracheal stent alternative. And uh, Magmaris has already been uh, uh, been studied in, the, in, in Europe uh, as a cardiovascular uh, stent, and, uh, and they have been clinically proven that the resolvable magnesium can, can work. Uh, but once again, the problem with magnesium is fast degradation, as we talked about, and low ductility, because magnesium being a hexagonal close pack uh, uh, structure, it has low ductility. So you need to improve the corrosion resistance and improve the ductility. So we have identified what we call as VASOMAG as our solution. It's a patent pending ultra high ductility magnesium alloy that we have developed. And <clears throat> 
uh, and it's a strong, it's five times stronger than polymer. It's therapeutic because it inhibits tissue growth, keeps the vessels open. It's also degradable, completely degrading in six to 12 months. So what did we do? The way we did it is by adding a little bit of lithium, about six to 9% lithium. When you add that, uh, it converts the hexagonal close pack structure of magnesium into a body centered cubic form, which makes it highly ductile. And then we add a little bit of zinc to it. So we have 6% lithium and 1% zinc uh, as a strengthening agent. Uh, so lithium helps to make it ductile, zinc provides the, the strength. So we ended up fabricating the strength by uh, the strength by first uh, extruding the rod and then doing wire EDM uh, to cut it into a tube and then do laser cutting to prepare the prototype strength, which is about diameter 4.2 millimeters, around 300 micron wall thickness and 10 millimeters in length. And then we subjected it to electrochemical polishing as shown here using phosphoric acid and ethanol mixture uh, to create using a DC voltage to form the electrochemical polishing to create the smooth architecture on the surface. <clears throat> and this shows the, the LG61 stent and the AG31 stent, which was used uh, as an alternative as a control and 316 stainless steel stent. So all of them were wire ADM and then electrochemically polished, showing the smooth surface that comes before polishing. Look at the laser rough laser surfaces, laser cut surfaces, and then by wire ADM, you get the smooth surface. And this basically shows how we essentially took the stent and then uh, we can expand it all the way from 4.2 millimeters to 5 millimeters. So going from 4.2 to 5 millimeters, as shown here by injecting the saline solution into the stent, it can nicely be ex expanded. So it's amenable for balloon expansion without undergoing any fracture. So no fracture was observed. <clears throat> so we can then crimp crimp it as well as shown here. So we did the crimping test uh, to make sure going all the way from 5.6 millimeter to two millimeter and we still did not see any fracture. So we then looked at its implantation in a healthy rabbit. Uh, so this was a study plan. So we took our magnesium alloy stent group, the LG61 stent group and the 316 uh, stainless steel as a control. So we looked at four weeks, eight weeks and 12 weeks Point. And this is how it was surgically implanted inside the rabbit trachea. And this is the X-ray image of the as implanted tracheal stent. This is the stainless steel clearly visible because of the radio opacity. The LV61 stent is not that visible because of the density, as we said, matching that of the cartilage. But they were both implanted and the positions were verified by the X-ray image as shown here. Uh, and <clears throat> this is the classic result that you see uh, the endoscopic imaging of the stent being placed into the uh, into the lumen of the trachea. So this is the LG61 stent after immediately after implantation. This is after four weeks, you see some granulation tissue, eight weeks, it's completely degraded and 12 weeks, healthy lumen growth of the, of the rabbit trachea, matching that of the normal rabbit trachea. On the other hand, stainless steel clearly shows presence of granulation tissue, increase in granulation tissue and almost significant growth, uh, almost nearing closure of the trachea after 12 weeks. <clears throat> so we also did uh, uh, optical coherence uh, tomography uh, to see the presence of hydrogen pockets and looking at the lumen size. And uh, so this is for the stainless steel stainless stain. This is for the LG61 uh, stent. And you can clearly see the tracheal lumen size, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks. You can clearly see in the case of stainless uh, steel, uh, there is there is no growth of the lumen, whereas in the case of the magnesium LG61 stent, the initial lumen size <clears throat> is similar to the stainless steel, but then after eight weeks and 12 weeks after the LG61 stent has degraded, there is normal growth of the lumen back to its normal healthy trachea. So <clears throat> we also looked at the in vivo implantation. So this is the micro CT images uh, of the uh, stent before implantation and after four weeks of implantation, after eight weeks of implantation, uh, and this is after 12 weeks of implantation. So in the case of the uh, stainless steel, uh, you can see uh, it remains without undergoing any degradation, so, whereas, whereas in the case of uh, 
But in the case of the LG61, you can clearly see that there is <coughs> degradation, you know, after four weeks. Uh, so eight weeks and 12 weeks, it is completely degraded. So at the four weeks, it has already undergone almost 30% degradation as shown here, whereas the stainless steel does not undergo any degradation at all. Then we looked at the uh, in vivo implantation, we did the HNE staining of the trachea to see the presence of epithelial cells, cartilage. Uh, so you can clearly see that the LG61 uh, stent degraded after eight weeks of implantation, leaving a highly vascularized submucosa seen even up to 12 weeks, similar to the normal rabbit trachea. Uh, whereas in the case of uh, four weeks and eight weeks, we also look at presence of giant cells and clearly see that we see giant cells only in the beginning, but then they are not observed <coughs> in the, at eight and 12 weeks at all. And then this is the H&E uh, staining of the stainless steel. So clearly you can see that the epithelium layer was normal compared to the normal rabbit trachea. The submucosa peeled off uh, due to encapsulation of the stent and its non-ability to degrade. So then we also did alcyon blue staining to see presence of mucus and goblet cells. And uh, as shown here between comparison of stainless steel and the uh, our alloy with the control, you can clearly see that there is initially uh, a larger number of density of mucus and goblet cells, but then after four weeks and eight weeks, they are restored to normal. We also looked at the cluster uh, differentiation of uh, 68 uh, staining for macrophage cells. Uh, and clearly you see the cluster of macrophages only in the beginning of four weeks, but then after eight weeks and 12 weeks, you do not see it present, whereas it remains in the stainless steel. Uh, so clearly showing that the density of macrophage cells were restored to normal in our LG61 alloys at eight weeks and 12 weeks. But the clusters can still be seen at week 12 in the stainless steel system. So to summarize, basically, we have developed novel biodegradable metals uh, for stent fabrication and in vivo implantation in the rabbit airway model for four to eight weeks. and the Alloy-based stent was well tolerated and was fully degraded, inhibiting any further growth of the trachea. So, final conclusion is the we identified alloying elements with the first principle calculation for novel bioresorbable magnesium alloy that exhibited control corrosion mechanical properties. We made these alloys by melting, casting, and extrusion, and we made high-strength alloys which showed optimal bioresorbable characteristics and showing safe response inside the body, uh, eliciting no adverse toxic response. And then we also made ultra high ductility alloys as well. So this is the support that helped to uh, develop all these alloys over the past 10 years uh, of support from NSF and IBCR, uh, state of Pennsylvania, as well as DOD. Thank you and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. <clears throat>